to start this new year. Um, we Today we're going to start off with Jason Lopez, who took a job right before he completed his CE. He's working on urban sanitation in Liberia and Monrovia. And um, Jason's, you know, came from the Peace Corps before he came to this program and had a passion for sanitation, basic sanitation. And, um, you know, he was really excited to get back out to the field and he was so excited he got to the field a little sooner than, than he had probably planned. But um, it was a pleasure working with you, Jason. And this is a really important topic because it affects the most vulnerable populations. This topic that he covered in his CE, which he's going to be talking about sanitation in flood prone areas. So it affects basically really vulnerable populations choosing to live in land, on land that is um, basically unwanted because of all the flooding. And of course, the, you know that once flooding occurs, this can result in major exposures to to enteric pathogens. So this is something he's passionate about and has really dug in deep on. And I'm going to let you take over uh, from here, Jason, OK? Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Are we good? Can you start? Yes. Please go for it. OK. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, my name is Jason Lopez. I'm going to present my CE presentation on improving sanitation in flood prone areas, perceptions and practices amongst sanitation experts. I worked, uh, I worked uh, in collaboration with uh, Mike Holdwell, who is an uh, MPH from QW as well, and he's currently living in Cambodia, working in Cambodia, and Professor Jay Grant. Uh, so, improving uh, sanitation has the potential to increase personal safety, productivity, income, as well as improve nutrition, health, cognitive development, uh, especially through the reduction in uh, incidence of diarrheal disease and stunting. Uh, I'm looking at the main sanitation sector, flood prone areas face uh, additional obstacles. Next slide. Introduction. Uh, so, so safe sanitation is the, uh, if you think human is free disposal, for example, using a uh, filter train or a, a toilet, uh, or a toilet. Uh, unsafe sanitation is a major contributor to loss of visibility of adjusted lectures, especially for children under five. Uh, it's the fourth highest rank cause of balance loss for children under five. Uh, and and six in Southeast Asia and six in Cambodia. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, so worldwide, about 2.4 billion people still like access to improved sanitation. That's about a third of the of the world's population. So, if you look to your left, and then look to your right, and then look at yourself, and you're the one without sanitation. So, so there's a um, so there's there's also a gap between uh, urban and rural, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, for example, in Cambodia, they have 88% uh, coverage in urban areas, but only 30% in rural areas. Uh, there's been, um, there has been, a, you know, increases in the coverage of sanitation, but the NDG goal of having the portion of people without access to sanitation uh, failed, which was that they did not make its goals. Uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, we got to 38% and 33% increase. Uh, next slide. So, so flood prone areas and sanitation. Uh, so, flood prone areas is one that experiences a flooding event. The second study is one that experiences a flooding event at least once every five years. In many parts of the world, flooding happens through the sea zone, it's a traditional part of life, uh, the agriculture. Uh, so, basically, flooding increases uh, exposure to species as the water rises uh, as the rinse and prevents and uh, prevents to take a uh, you know, cheese and other pathogens with it and, and spread it around the environment. Uh, also, a normal pit latrine or a ground level latrine, uh, you won't have access to it during a, during a flooding event. So you'd have to resort to something like open defecation. Uh, climate change is set to make the problem worse as the uh, frequency and, uh, and magnitude of flooding events increases. You know, the research to support this and uh, specific to, to Cambodia, for example. Uh, the 
table with the medical goals, uh, call for 100% uh, coverage, 100% sanitation coverage by 2030, uh, without addressing left zone areas and other challenging environments, uh, you won't be able to reach that, that goal. Uh, for example, uh, approximately 25% of Cambodians uh, live in left zone areas. Next slide. So the aims of the study are to uh, identify trends in the sector and current approaches and practices, as well as barriers and challenges to implementation. Also to provide recommendations to improve the effectiveness and sustain impact of these programs. And the right to a photo of, uh, of uh, that one is in uh, Brazil, actually, but it could be in a lot of parts of the world. It could be here in, in Liberia, it could be Cambodia. Uh, it's not an uncommon site. Um, next slide, a method. So this is a, a mixed method uh, study. There's two parts of the online survey and in-depth interviews. The online surveys were persons who were working in sanitation and equipment areas. Uh, they were recruited through email, uh, social media, uh, uh, online uh, professional forums, uh, snowball, word of mouth uh, recruitment. The surveys are done on, uh, on the, web, the website of SurveyMonkey. They were open-ended, multiple choice, close, close questions, and scale questions where you say zero being, you know, least important and five being most important. And then the results were analyzed in Excel. The other thing is that in-depth interviews, we focused on implementers in, in Cambodia. Uh, using an interview guide, we uh, recorded the, the interviews uh, through Skype, and then they were transcribed and included in analyzing using uh, deduce uh, qualitative analysis software using thematic analysis. Um, the next slide, uh, framework. The framework for, uh, for the study was using uh, demand, uh, supply, demand, and enabling environment. Uh, was supply further broken down by the, uh, the sanitation value chain for capture, storage, uh, transportation, disposal. And within each of these categories, uh, they identified the approaches, implementation, barriers, implementation, and what needs to be accomplished to successfully implement programming. Next slide, results. So there were 26 completed surveys altogether out of 96 uh, attempts, or 96 persons identified. Um, they consisted of donors, implementers, and uh, research institutions from 11 different countries. 58% uh, of the survey participants were from uh, Southeast Asia. For the interviews, there were six in-depth interviews from five different implementing organizations. All these persons were health professionals, either engineers or the public health persons. The interviews lasted about 35 minutes to an hour, and there were 89 uh, codes altogether. All of, the, uh, all of the interview participants also participated in the, in the online uh, survey as well. So, um, sanitation technology for flood areas is supply. The next slide. Uh, so, for capture technology, poor flush and dry toilets were the, were the most common, uh, followed by uh, urine diverting uh, dry toilets, or DDT as they also referred to. Uh, for the uh, for that, Southeast Asia, poor flush are, are the most, uh, uh, most requested, or most popular type of uh, the type. Uh, for storage technology, they use the single pit, uh, septic tank, and then the activation bulbs, and then also a few people who did uh, uh, household uh, biodigesters. Um, of the, of the, fixed, uh, the technology, 81% designed the technology to be flood resistant from the beginning. For a single pit latrine that involves, uh, you can involve raising the pit latrine to above the flood line. And for a septic tank, it also involves raising the septic tank, but on top of the, the septic tanks that are, are built to be sealed, uh, so no water can get in or out. Um, and for disposal, most uh, the vast majority of participants rely on a uh, hand hand emptying storage, so like emptying of the of tanks and tanks by, by hand. <clears throat> Next slide, uh, supply barriers and needs. Uh, so the barriers uh, to supply were unsustainable technologies and also groundwater contamination. 
Sustainable uh, technologies means uh, using you know, basic pivot uh, trees or forecast trees that are that, that they don't work in a flood. They are they are ground level or if they're raised, not raised high enough, uh, so that when the flood comes, it either could either collapse the hole, it doesn't exist, or it just ex general exposure of species, and then you can't use them during a uh, during the flooding event. Uh, on top of that, uh, a lot of the sites that were in flood plan areas also had uh, high ground water tables, uh, which meant that a uh, average flood tree would uh, would contaminate the uh, the groundwater as well. Um, and this initial barrier was uh, supply chain, transportation, and, and, and cost. So these uh, these areas are hard to access. Uh, for uh, some of uh, the the roads can be waterlogged in you know, six months out of the year during the during the flood season, uh, which makes it hard for transportation. Some of these are only accessible by by boat, uh, for example, or or, or a motorcycle that could hit by road. Uh, it leads to increased construction costs, not just because of the supply chain, but because of the technology that were adequate for uh, for flood prone areas tended to be more uh, elaborate. Uh, use more materials, it required a, a higher level of craftsmanship, which, which added to the cost. And the, the need identified by the uh, participants were need for innovation and adaptation of technologies. So, either creating new technologies or adapting existing technologies to work in, in flood prone areas. Um, safe disposal uh, methods. So, there was a need to um, to identify uh, a way to, to clear out uh, any new technology, a way to, to properly dispose of the of the experience, and then reduce costs. So a lot of it, there are existing technology to address uh, annotation components, but they are tend to be uh, very expensive. And the quote on the right is, uh, is a reference to uh, unsustainable with uh, the new technology. Next slide. So demand creation in FPA, um, the most common uh, demand creation activity was uh, community land total sanitation or CLTS, uh, followed by none, and also there was some sanitation marketing. Uh, I will say that a lot of these projects were, were pilots, uh, and they didn't always uh, take into consideration the, uh, the, the behavior change portion of the project, so we're more focused on the technologies. Um, the barriers to uh, next slide. Um, so the, the barriers to uh, to demand creation in uh, flood prone areas were one thing: the high price tag of these of these technologies that, that didn't work. They were just out of reach for the average uh, consumer, so they were just you know, the, the price was just unusable. The feasibility of the, of the current technologies, meaning that they were unable to find a, a technology that was either suitable or inexpensive. Uh, they just wouldn't do demand, they just didn't bother doing demand creation activities. They're like, we can't, you know, we're not going to do CLTS, we're not going to do sanitation marketing, we don't have a product to even offer. Um, this, uh, the last area was what I mentioned with subsidies. So, in this replies, not necessarily just the flipper areas, but also to sanitation in general. There are, there are issues with community members not either waiting to get a, a subsidy or the solid neighbor can next turn over to get one and weren't willing to invest in a uh, and a train on their own. Uh, the need uh, for the grant creation or activities, uh, behavior change activities designed for flood prone areas. Uh, one example would be the use of CLTS in these areas. So right now, uh, if you use CLTS, tries to uh, the CLTS approach tries to get people on the sanitation ladder, meaning that they maybe fashion some uh, simple pit latrine or something that, that gets them to stop open vegetation. However, in a flood prone area, that wouldn't won't be appropriate because the, the, wherever they don't, will not necessarily withstand a, uh, a flooding event. So, whatever whatever behavior change activities are implemented in the area need to be appropriate not only for the area but also the technology that's being used. The, uh, the quote on the right uh, refers to the feasibility of the, of the current technology. Uh, next slide: the neighboring environment. So the approaches, um, so about 23% of those surveyed uh, didn't offer any sort of subsidy. 
And another 27 shows offered full 100% subsidies. Uh, another 15% didn't know, and the rest fell somewhere in between. Uh, the barriers of, uh, for the enabling environment in the areas was, first of all, time. Um, so these areas uh, are flooded, you know, for large parts of the year, uh, meaning the required program requires more time to, to implement, you can only build or implement just so many months out of the year um, in order to accommodate for the flooding. Uh, this leads into funding issues, uh, the program, the program might take longer, uh, and also with transportation issues, this might lead to, to additional costs compared to other uh, other uh, sanitation implementation programs. And finally, for a back of, uh, better phrase, the uh, stakeholder apathy. So right now, there's a, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit at the moment in, uh, in, in, these, in these areas for, for implementing uh, sanitation and for selling uh, sanitation products, uh, which means that uh, NGOs and governments are focusing their energy toward that and not necessarily addressing or even avoiding uh, some of these flood-point areas and challenging environments. Uh, the, the needs identified were uh, more stakeholder participation and information sharing. Uh, so we need to be start beginning the conversation as to how to best uh, address uh, sanitation in, in some flood areas. Um, we also identified the need for uh, regulation. So there is existing regulation in, in Cambodia. So it's not very well enforced and it's basically don't build a pivot train so many meters from the river and so many meters from a water point. Um, but it's not very well enforced and, and there's issues of, uh, especially the issue of sanitation marketing of, of these products being available and sold to few persons uh, that aren't appropriate. So if you build a ground level pivot train in a, in a flood prone area, it's not, it's not the most appropriate technology and if it's an area that has, also has high groundwater level there's opportunities for groundwater contamination. Um, and then finally, it was targeted uh, subsidies. I know that uh, subsidies were addressed as a barrier before, but here they're, they're getting a need for well, collaboration between stakeholders to say that, well, if you are going to provide subsidies, you should consider doing it in a flood prone area because, uh, they, because not only increase cost of materials, these tend to be very uh, poor populations. Uh, we can tend to live in the reason that these are marginalized communities are uh, many times and they will be most in need for a, uh, a subsidy. And the, the, the quote on the right uh, speaks to this. Uh, limitations of the study. Um, the study has uh, limited general liability at 12 sample size. The participants weren't randomly selected and uh, Southeast Asia is over, overrepresented. There's also the opportunity for a new call by the participants may not uh, may not remember events accurately. Uh, we've also to consider our value goal that you have to knowledge base uh, knowledge base and some of those results are, are more applicable at a, at a general level. Um, recommendation, next slide. Um, so for supply, we have uh, identifying design designs that are appropriate and affordable technologies for tool prone areas. Uh, along with that, developing specific discrete disposal, disposal methods for these technologies. And adapting uh, the supply chain to address these challenges and also, that's also a method to identify uh, cost reduction. Uh, for demand, it's, it's, it's develop a uh, flood prone area appropriate uh, container change uh, approaches and uh, consider applying sanitation marketing to such technology uh, that is suitable for flood prone area. Next slide. For the enabling environment, to, the recommendations are to increase uh, stakeholder involvement, including the government, NGOs, and the, and the private sector to, to try to address this before, uh, uh, before it becomes a more immediate issue and try to find solutions now. Um, Enforcement of regulation to ensure uh, technologies are adequately used in the adequate technologies used in these areas. Um, inter the introduction of targeted subsidies for the oldest persons in the challenging environment. And finally, to coordinate between uh, shared orders for sharing of knowledge, uh, technologies, uh, and the 
and the appropriate use of the, the policy. Uh, next one, uh, acknowledgement. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Graham, uh, Mike Coswell, who is also the uh, chief foreman on this, um, my fiance, Ellie, who is in the Karen Gage, um, EWP Australia Engineers about Border Australia, who has also done trying to, to push this the topic and we've been very we very helpful along along with uh, Susan Blackett who has done uh, who's done also done research in uh, in Indonesia on uh, on challenging environments. Uh, my sister, uh Amina and uh, I'd also like to uh, thank Jerome uh at Henson. He spoke to me about this uh, early on and gave me some put me in contact with some very knowledgeable people. Uh, he also uh, he also passed away last week, and I got to keep uh, people to keep him in, his, in their talk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anybody have any questions? Research. What would you do differently to, to fix that? Um, I would uh, I would have probably separated out the the, the interviews from the uh, from the, the interviews first and then the survey. That would allow me to to maybe narrow my the questions down and to be much more applicable and relevant and go together. Uh, so that would make the survey shorter. And uh, also, um, I guess maybe with some some way of making it very clear to people that this is uh, um, maybe maybe very upfront. Uh, say that this is, is anonymous, it's brief, and uh, and you can have uh, multiple attempts to try to, to finish it. Uh, I mean, there were 96 people who were who got through the first you know, four questions and identified as having worked in these areas. So it would have been nice to have a all my textbooks to the uh, reply. The dissemination was the next. No, uh, that was, I wasn't necessarily concerned about it. It's a problem that many of us have had, right. uh, and many of our students have had when we try to do primary data collection. But I wanted to hear more about what he tried, mm -hmm. how long he stayed at it, how many requests, how, how you know, widely distributed, and then also what he would recommend as to more robust response going forward. If he had had a year to constantly nag and, and remind and beg uh, yeah. stakeholders, he would also have got a higher response. So if he had an ideal scenario, what would he have done differently to get a stronger response? Those yeah. are my, my questions. So Jason, if, you, if someone said you had to get 96 people to complete your survey, what were what would what are some things you might do to to achieve that? Uh, do cards to outback steakhouse. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then uh, I get giving it more time. I my schedule is open for for twenty five days. Uh, time can also help. Uh, also, if you're able to identify exactly who those ninety six people are. Uh, and, and, and some ask them how they would do, you know, I personally ask them what help. Uh, I would only be able to do that with, you know, uh, let's say uh, out of the, out of the following me, do that with about 20 individuals where I'll get to send them a personal email that I know you work here, uh, who's replied to the survey that I'm um, So that, that would help. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. If you can repeat it. Okay. With the information you have from your study, do you think that there's a realistic technology that could be available for floodplain areas? So with or the, for these floodplain areas. So with the research that you've conducted, do you feel that there's a technology that could be appropriate for the flood prone areas that you sort of were dealing with? Uh, yeah, there's some technology that show uh, a lot of trauma. The problem is uh, there's a couple of problems. One is, is cost. Of course, that's just the uh, one. The first step of the any uh, ideation is to, to get the, the product to work, and then from there you can work on reducing cost. There's a technology called an aquacurvy, which is basically a, a, that was working pretty well. That was um, uh, basically a, a septic tank that's part of the, the tree. So instead of having a separate septic tank unit, you sit right on it. Uh, that was a cost reduction in itself. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, there's, a, there's a, another way to reduce cost to actually start trying to uh, consider using shared sanitation. I know that's not part, that's not considered improved sanitation, but it would do a great deal to, to decrease cost, either whether it be, even if it's, you know, three toilets on the same system, each family owns each, you know, individual toilet, but, but just something that can that can uh, help you know, reduce some of these uh, infrastructure costs. What do you, um, I have a question for you. What are you planning to, how would you like to disseminate the results of this and what do you hope that they can, I guess, achieve? Um, <laughs> I think the most thing I can hope for is to get folks to start talking about this, and then also we go to disseminating it through, uh, yeah, I'd like to get it published into a, a journal to uh, help you get that extra level of scrutiny and validation. Um, uh, and we have a primary number amount of articles on the Huffington Post, so somehow I can't get up on there, I, I wouldn't mind that either. Uh, but to get people to, to talk about this, and maybe to, it would be worthwhile to start focusing. Uh, I, I know people like to invent a toilet every, every six months somewhere, um, a, new, a new kind of toilet. So maybe we get some of these efforts to, uh, to focus in more on, on things that are important, like, like sanitation and challenging environment, uh, which includes high water tables, or building over a rock, um, you know, and areas that, that's more. I hope that answered the question on that amount. Great. You did a nice job. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice job. Yeah,